Hey everybody, I'm Jack Reeder with Future Pastimes, and I'm a designer on Dune-themed games and expansions, and we are reading Dune. Now we're into an interesting chapter that picks up right where the action ended two chapters ago with Paul and Jessica. Ornithopters uh, had suddenly appeared, and they were bracing for an attack, but Paul once again recognizes that it's Duncan's flying style on the lead ornithopter, so he knows that it's Duncan, and indeed it is, as he gets out, and they are also met by Dr. Kynes uh, and other Fremen, and they are led to a secret entrance to an ecological testing station. So they, uh, they cover the ornithopters with tarps so that they look like just uh, more sand dunes in the desert, and uh, Liette uh, Kynes uh, gets some coffee service going with uh, his Fremen, and they retire to a room to have a, a conversation. So uh, Dr. Kynes at that point is aware that uh, the Duke is dead and Paul is now the new Duke. And as Paul and Jessica are scoping out the room and learning everything they can about it, including that there's a hidden passageway out of it, um, just through the use of their Bene Gesserit skills of observation. And Kynes is wondering to himself, why am I helping these people? Because it would be so easy to just turn them over to the Harkonnens and get some goodwill since they're in charge now and they seem to have the upper hand. But something is uh, preventing him from doing that. And quickly into the conversation, he realizes it's because the Atreides are just they're just better people, and uh, and they're more in line with the goals that he and the Fremen have. Um, and Paul senses this as well. So he explains that the situation that they're in, where they have been wiped out almost entirely um, with the help of the Emperor and the Sardaukar, and it's just the sort of thing that the other great houses fear, which is why they have formed something called the Landsrad which is an organization of all the great houses so that they can work together in order to match the strength of the Imperium itself. Um, but it's a complicated process, and Paul is explaining that he is prepared to bring a bill of particulars before the Emperor, accusing him of having a role in this. Uh, but if he does, as Kynes points out, it's just going to lead to chaos and total war amongst the houses. But Paul counters that he will give the emperor a way out, and that is be, by uh, offering to be wed to one of the emperor's many daughters. And he has no sons, and this is a patriarchy. And so Kynes is like, I don't know, you know, you're going to go for the throne. And Paul is like, the emperor will not risk open warfare. This really is his only way out. And uh, he, he says, look, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this without your help. Um, and he seems to indicate that uh, uh, he could buy Kynes' loyalty by offering that as the emperor, I can make Arrakis a paradise with the wave of my hand. But uh, Kynes is like, no, um, you know, my loyalty is not for sale. And Paul says, you know what, you're right, and, and I apologize for that. That was, a, that was poor form. And Kynes is like, yeah, this is, this is really why the Atreides are better. He's like, you know, Harkonnen would have ever admitted to him a mistake like that. So maybe you are um, what you have claimed to be this whole time. Um, and what Paul says, is, look, uh, I, I think I can offer you coin that you will accept. And he says, I will dedicate myself to you and I will, I will give my life for you uh, fully and totally. And Kynes is blown away by this. And he's like, sire, you can't do that. And, um, and he realizes that, uh, yeah, he's not talking to a teenage boy anymore. This is the Duke of House Atreides. And Paul has definitely risen to the challenge. And Jessica realizes this as well. Um, but before they can get any further into that kind of a conversation, um, the, the ecological testing station is attacked by Sardaukar. And they, they hear the, the commotion. They look out. They see Duncan fighting furiously against uh, overwhelming odds, and they see that he uh, is struck with a death blow uh, by the time they close the door. And Kynes is like, I guess I've made up my mind. I am going to help you. And so he gets them to an exit, and uh, he indicates that uh, it's a secret passage that has basically a labyrinth, uh, but there's this 
system of little arrowed lights that show up on the floor that point you to where you need to go and then the light goes out so he's like just follow the lights he's like i'm gonna go a different direction and um you know your path will take you to an ornithopter get in it and head for the storm um fremen routinely steal ornithopters and they fly into the storm they go really high up and they're able to withstand the destructive forces of the Coriolis storm so he's like that's your best bet and and Kynes takes off and Paul's like, yeah, this this is a good plan. Um, even if Kynes is captured, uh, he's not really going to know where we went. Um, although Kynes is like, he assures them, Fremen will find you. I have instructed them to seek you out. And, um, and Paul is confident that, in fact, they will find him. He believes Kynes. So he and Lady Jessica get into the ornithopter and they launch uh, into the night. They are immediately uh, set upon by uh, enemy ornithopters uh, firing all of their weapons at them. But Paul manages to evade them, flies into the storm, and then the storm basically takes hold of them. And he's like, I got no control. We're just going to have to ride it out. So that's that's what happens in this chapter. <clears throat> it's uh, it's action packed. It's got a lot of uh, great intrigue, a lot of political intrigue as Paul tries to quickly come up with a plan and he uh, he knows he, he has to take his revenge on House Harkonnen at some point, and the Emperor as well, to a degree. Um, but it's still just the early parts of a plan. And now, again, they have questions, but uh, I think Paul feels like that if they can connect with the Fremen, um, the Fremen are still going to be able to have the wherewithal to help him realize this plan. Um because one of the things he's like, can can your Fremen provide evidence that the Sardaukar were here? And Kynes is like, yeah, they probably can do that. Um, especially as the Fremen have been uh, routinely defeating the Sardaukar in open combat. Um, so Paul is filing all that away. Um, and uh, he he at one point mentions that he can take advantage of their legends of the Lisan al-Gaib, the voice from the outer world. But Kynes is like, you know, be careful with that. That's just superstition. And Paul's like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, so he's got that tucked away as well as something he can leverage if he feels like he needs to. So I, I, I love this chapter. Um, the fate of Duncan Idaho, of course, is uh, is always rough. He, I think for <laughs> just about anybody who reads Dune, he's a fan favorite, even in his uh, short existence in the Dune book, but stay tuned. Uh, the legend of Duncan will grow uh, in time. Um, in terms of adaptations, this uh, more or less uh, is best adapted by the Villeneuve movie. So in the in the Lynch movie, they, um, they don't ever hook up with Kynes again. And in fact, Duncan Idaho is killed in an Arakeen at the Keep as they are hauling Paul and Jessica away to the ornithopter initially. Um, so they, they just kind of <laughs> did away with them uh, very easily there. In the miniseries, um, it's it's pretty closely adapted up to a point. Um, they managed to get Paul and Jessica away on the ornithopter, uh, but then a missile comes and blows up Duncan. So it's a little bit different there, not quite as satisfying. Um, but the interaction with uh, Kynes, um, is fairly faithful, the miniseries, um, but it's probably most faithful in the Villeneuve movie. Um, it's interesting is that this scene in the book takes place at night. Uh, it's still kind of the middle of the day in the Villeneuve movie. And of course, um, it's just Duncan who brings them. Uh, uh, he's got Kynes is in the ornithopter with them when Duncan picks them up. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's, it's pretty close. It's... Um, it's a great scene in the movie where the coffee service is underway and and seeing audiences realize what it involves coffee service. It's it's saliva and, you know, spice mostly. That's how they make coffee. Um, but then, yeah, the Sardaukar dropping in and fighting it out. Now, in the book, they make a big deal about how the Sardaukar are actually wearing Harkonnen uh, livery. So they're they're dressed in the Harkonnen uniforms. They didn't bother with that in the movie, and I think part of that was just they wanted the audience to fully understand. Uh, in the in the Lynch movie, um, it's Sardaukar in uh, Harkonnen uniforms, 
um, as well as the miniseries. The Sardaukar have a little tattoo in the back of their neck, and that's how they're like, oh, look at this guy. They, they check his uniform. He's a Sardaukar. Um, so I think I think for the for the Denis Villeneuve movie, uh, they just felt like, all right, we want audiences to understand that the Sardaukar are involved. We want to indicate that they're a tougher breed of soldiers, so they have that scene. Um, it's not really in the book um, where the Atreides are forming a phalanx there on the uh, that, that phalanx on the stairs uh, and they're fighting the Harkonnen and they're keeping the upper hand but then the Sardaukar drop in behind them and then whew, make real short work of the Atreides there so that helps the audience to understand these are elite soldiers um, and then you know they up to this point we've we've heard in the book that the Fremen have had generally pretty easy time fighting the Sardaukar but in this uh, in this scene, they're, they're, everyone at the ecological testing station is overwhelmed. And certainly in the movie, um, while the Sardaukar march in and the Fremen surprise them by bursting out of the sand, which I'm not sure how they managed to do that. That's a neat trick. Um, but they ultimately, there's just more Sardaukar. So by the time they are fighting Duncan Idaho in the movie, um, it's it's all Sardaukar at that point. And... Uh, they uh, they just keep coming, so it's just more and more of them, and it's a it's a great fight scene. It's a great swan song for Duncan Idaho in the movie, um, probably the best version of it out of the book and all of the adaptations. Um, I mean, I like the focus on the dialogue in the Villeneuve movie is on the um, you know they want to they want to be able to get justice. Um, they're looking at the Lance Rad, but Kynes says, you know, the, that's not going to prove anything. And even if you can, he, uh, at, at that point, she um, explains that it will just lead to war. Um, but Paul follows that the train of thought that they established in the book, which I like, because that, that's really not um, really not adapted well in any of the other versions. So I like that they got that focus in there in the Villeneuve movie. Um, as well as the rest of the escape. So the, you can see that they've got the tunnel with the lights. Um, I've always wanted to see that that scene played out, and I think they did a pretty good job with that. Um, and so that's where we are. The fate of Kynes remains a question mark here at so far in the book. Paul and Jessica are currently swirling around in an ornithopter in the storm, uh, waiting to see <laughs> whether they can land or get out of it. Um, but yeah, an action-packed scene. So let me know your thoughts. What do you think of this uh, particular chapter in the book? If you have any questions, of course, we can get into it. Um, and then we'll we'll keep reading it. At some point soon, we're going to surpass the adaptation of the movie because part two doesn't come out. I was actually, when I started this, hoping that everything would line up and I could just keep reading the chapters as the uh, second movie was out, which would would have been out in about a week or so. That is not going to happen. So I'm just going to keep going in. Um, we'll speculate on what how it might be adapted uh, for the Villeneuve movie. Um, and at some point after that movie comes out, uh, we'll do a little book movie comparison video. But we're going to stick to the miniseries and the Lynch movie in terms of how close. But it, it, we're getting to the point now where the Lynch movie will deviate quite a bit from the book. Uh, partly because they didn't really film everything in there, partly because they edited out a lot of what they did film. Uh, the part two, uh, if you will, of the Lynch movie, uh, very compressed and you know, almost like a giant montage, uh, missing a lot of the fun details that I'm expecting we will get uh, a lot of in the Villeneuve adaptation. And that with the miniseries, it was... Uh, a mixed bag, and we'll cover that in there. So that's it for this video. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you again soon.